Did you know that Chicago has a building so massive that it had its own zip code? That's right, in the year 1930, the Merchandise Mart opened its doors to the world as the largest building in the world. Its four million square foot area served such a large influx of visitors daily that it required its own L-stop and a connection to Chicago's now abandoned 60 miles of underground freight tunnel. Perhaps what mystifies me most is that the Merchandise Mart was built above a massive train yard and that for many decades, freight delivery was possible right into the heart of Chicago. This near century old Art Deco masterpiece still stands on the bank of the Chicago River and serves around 20,000 people daily in modern times. In ways, this building has also been disconnected from its origins, as emphasized by this permanently lifted train bridge, leading to a track line that has long since ceased to run. Begging the question, what exactly happened here? Today we discover Chicago's merchandise mart. I'm your host Ryan Sokash and you're watching It's History. Merchandise Mart was at one point the largest building in the world, and I've noticed with making these videos that many of our greatest structures had similar titles when they were first erected. For example, after watching the documentary Vertical City on Magellan TV, the sponsor of this video, I learned that Chicago's John Hancock building was the tallest building outside of New York City in 1968. Its design revolutionized the way steel buildings were erected, but it also brought great controversy. And the great news is that once you finish watching our episode, you can also watch that documentary free of charge. Let me explain. Magellan TV is a rising star in the streaming world. It's the best value of any premium documentary streaming service in both price and quality. Actually, it's the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play. Magellan TV adds over 20 plus hours of new content weekly. 4K is always included in your subscription and here's the best part. No ads ever. As a history enthusiast, I appreciate the service because Magellan TV is all about the drama of real life, the lives of ancient pharaohs, critical battles in the World Wars 1 and 2, soldiers who fought in the Civil War, the battles for control of the British crown, the Norman conquest, and Magellan TV has the largest and best collection of history shows anywhere. The news gets better. Now that the holiday season's upon us, Magellan TV offers membership gift cards available all year round. Give the gift of TV worth watching. Great for any holiday or last minute occasion. Magellan TV gift cards are an easy gift with great value. In fact, a Magellan TV gift card is what I'm putting under the tree for my wife this holiday. And I already know it will be the perfect present. So claim your special offer of a free trial for Magellan TV by clicking my link in the description below. And now, back to Chicago's Merchandise Mart. Surprisingly, the site of the modern-day Merchandise Mart has a long-standing tradition for commerce. This river junction was used by the Native Americans who ran a trading post, signifying that its location was perfect for business. What's more, a look at any early 19th century map shows just how prominent and accessible this part of the riverbank was. Following European settlement, the area would be set up with city blocks as depicted in this map from 1834. Later, some of the structures were cleared away to make room for the Wells Street Station, built by the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad, a part of the first railroad in Chicago. This station opened in 1853, but was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1871. At that point, a temporary wooden train terminal sat on the site that would become today's Merchandise Mart until 1881, when the Wells Street Station was rebuilt and opened, serving Chicago until 1911, when it was ultimately abandoned. For years, this station waited in neglect, as the adjacent rails were now used for freight, leading decision makers to an exciting conclusion. The air rights for those tracks could be used to establish a commerce center like no other with elevators servicing track level, as well as rapid shipping with a dedicated connection to the Chicago tunnels. After all, 
According to the Chicago Tribune's Thomas Furlong, the location was within a night's journey by rail or four hours by air from a territory embracing 47% of the nation's population and 70% of wholesales and 65% of its retail outlets. With figures like those, it doesn't take much to understand why this once decrepit little corner of Chicago was so valuable. And with the powerful Marshall Fields at the helm, it seemed that everyone was on board. Reporters made exciting premonitions which helped justify using the air rights in this way. The National Hotel reporter noted, quote, 30% of all electricity used in Chicago is used in the transportation of people, referring to electric trains. But changes were on the horizon, as surveys suggested that Chicago residents would buy 1,889,407 passenger automobiles in the next two decades, and that by the year 1950, 2,934,110 cars would be added to the Chicago streets. This would suggest that the rise of automobiles would lead to the downfall of trains. Hence, for anyone who was in doubt, the PR was established. The tracks where the merchandise mart now sits were destined for a very different future, and this was reinforced by other city plans. For example, in 1926, a westward extension of Wacker Drive brought more development to the south bank of the Chicago River. And so it was. Ground broke on August the 16th, 1928. The building was to be so massive that general contractor John Griffiths and Sons used techniques typical to dam construction. Concrete arrived by boat and was lifted into bins 75 feet above the ground, with gravel and sand deliveries by railroad to conveyor belts and transfer elevators. Giant mixers provided wet concrete to skip hoists and vertical towers that extended as the building rose. The crew consisted of up to 5,700 men, with the construction project lasting into the first year of the Great Depression. 458 reinforced concrete caissons sunk between 80 to 100 feet below ground would support the whole structure 25 feet above the tracks and seamlessly meld the mart with the downtown streets. I need to underline just how big of a project this was. The foundation was nearly two square city blocks. 29 million bricks were laid, 40 miles of plumbing were installed, 380 miles of wiring was needed, and almost 4 million cubic feet of concrete was poured. The building has 4,000 windows and steel components weighing up to 60,000 tons, not to mention 35,000 electric lamps, 30 elevators, and the building itself consisting of approximately 7.5 miles of corridors. All that being said, it might surprise you to hear that construction cost was just $26 million. Obviously, inflation has occurred since then. Anyhow, Merchandise Mart opened on May the 5th, 1930, and provided Marshall Fields with a single wholesale center consisting of 13 warehouses and changed ownerships on numerous occasions. In the mid-1940s, the Kennedy family made a purchase via Merchandise Mart Properties Incorporated for a reported $13 million, which was half the construction price. It's been speculated that this lowball price was based on an oral agreement between Fields and Kennedy. With the condition that after the sale, Kennedy would donate the building to the University of Chicago. Kennedy would enjoy a tax deduction as a result of this transaction. But again, there is no known evidence of this. What's more, it's not how things played out. You see, the revenues were retained as a vital part of the family's empire until 1998, when it was finally sold for $625 million. Apparently, at the time of its sale, the Merchandise Mart was the Kennedy family's last remaining operational business. From the start, this monumental structure was intended to be a city within a city. It was the largest building in the world until 1943 when the Pentagon surpassed it. The Merchandise Mart was also difficult to categorize as it was a warehouse, a department store, and a skyscraper all in one. Beyond its sheer size, it also offered artistry. The Art Deco exterior matched that of the Chicago Board of Trade Building, with ribbon piers defining the windows. The south corner pavilions the highest, 
And initially, 56 sculpted American Indian heads once adorned the building in remembrance of the site as a Native American trading post. Most of these marvelous seven-foot-tall statues were removed in 1961, and according to Twitter, which I admit is not the most reliable source, some remain on the north and east sides. We can't show those images here on YouTube, but if you visit my archive on Instagram, you'll be able to see them there. It's difficult for me to determine precisely what happened to the rest of them though, but according to CBS, one family purchased a home in Lake Forest back in 1983, which happened to have two of those massive sculptures in the backyard, and they came with the house. So with the 7.5 miles of hallway to explore, let's have a look at what's inside the finished building. The first two floors of the building were occupied by restaurants and stores, while the third to sixth levels were occupied by Marshall Fields and Company. Display showrooms and hundreds of offices would occupy the remaining floors. In no time, the Merchandise Mart became a cornerstone of the city. But it wasn't just a place for professionals. It was what I'd consider consumer recreation, with a vibe more similar to IKEA or your standard mall. Even back in 1928, the Chicago Tribune pointed out that by bringing hundreds of tenant firms under one impressive piece of architecture, a visitor from, say, Minnesota could accomplish their work in a concentrated and convenient fashion. What can be accomplished there in a few hours would have otherwise taken several days. You don't even need to leave for lunch or visit a postal office. Even smoking was possible within several various lounges. For example, hoarders opened a shop in the mart and they suggested that shoppers would enjoy, quote, Chicago's longest indoor street. The shop offered a variety of 13,000 items, most of which were stationary related. The National Hotel Reporter from October the 23rd of opening year recalled the building's restaurant, stating that seeing is believing, describing a mammoth coffee shop, tabled mezzanine tea room, and lengthy soda fountain counter with a, quote, delightful men grill and main dining room, offering guests great beauty and dignity. The author claims that the grand opening was the biggest restaurant opening in history. Thousands were turned away. In the lobby, diners enjoyed a rather outstanding novelty, a replica of Wolf Tavern the first inn built in Chicago. Another ad for the Merchandise Mart restaurant gives us an exciting insight into the types of foods that were served in that time period. For example, the coffee plate luncheon in suit 45C offered cream of asparagus or clear consomme, browned beef stew with vegetables and mashed potatoes. One could enjoy homemade baked pork and beans, Boston brown bread, and a beverage of coffee, tea, or milk. Reading this menu makes me believe that diners enjoyed the, quote, beauty and dignity. They might even be appalled by the menu these days. So out of curiosity, I had a look at the restaurants currently occupying the Mart, and out of the 20 to choose from, I feel like some of the modern highlights really set a tone. McDonald's, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, and so on. Although to be fair, when I checked the Mart's social media, I did see some pretty tasty looking food pictures. Anyhow, the restaurant was so massive that when it opened, it was estimated that 10,000 people could be fed daily in a seating capacity of 1,400 guests at any given time between opening at 7 a.m. and midnight. All this required a staff of 500 men and women, and service was classy, a tone that was set by the building's great lobby. Visitors would typically enter a mammoth lobby, defined by eight square marble pillars with stone fronts and bronze trim, all illuminated by ornamental lighting affixed to cornices above. The floor was an unusual composition of green and orange that guests would follow to elevator banks. The elevators could be used to access upper floors, where an area known as Business Boulevard offered two 650-foot-wide corridors similar to the lobby below. There was one key difference, however, the endless display windows providing breathtaking views of the city below. But there was actually an area on the upper floors with no windows. This area contained the most powerful technology of the era, radio broadcast. As early as November of 1929, when it was reported that the National Broadcasting Company would have the most extensive broadcasting quarters in the world, occupying 62,000 square feet of floor space, 
on the top floor of the new Merchandise Mart in Chicago of January the 1st, the following year. Six studios were built, one of which stands out as the city's pretentious radio theater. Offices and so-called laboratories occupied the rest of the space. But by laboratories, do you think they meant restrooms or like actual laboratories? Let me know in the comments. Anyhow, even when this was just a concept, the tentative opening was promoted nationally, bolstering that Chicago would be the greatest broadcasting center in the world, better than New York, Washington, and San Francisco. Studio A was, in fact, the best and largest radio theater in the world at 70 feet long, 35 feet wide, and 26 feet high, not to mention the total floor space of 3,820 square feet. The standing room could accommodate over a thousand people. The loft contained a grand pipe organ, specially adapted for for radio presentation. Supporting this studio on the 19th floor were lockers, reception rooms, announcer rooms, a music library, and a first aid room. Above that, on the 20th floor, sat the vice president of the Chicago division and his staff. Also, on the 20th floor was an observation area for visitors to enjoy the various productions occurring in the studios throughout the day. Despite the studio's excellent location on the upper floors, however, soundproofing was a potential issue, so no windows were installed. Ventilation was made possible with modern equipment that maintained a constant flow of pure air at a regulated temperature and with controlled humidity. In fact, one newspaper from September the 7th, 1930, points out that when Merchandise Mart first opened, it hosted the largest radio school in the world. The ad invited the public to visit the Chicago RCA Institute, which had trained thousands of men since 1909 and guaranteed job placement within three to 10 days following graduation. On a side note, I haven't lived in Chicago for some time, but if memory serves me well, q on a one is actually based in Merchandise Mart, right? I'm curious if they actually use these historic theaters. Is that where Man Cow in the Morning happens? Let me know in the comments. Merchandise Mart has its own L-stop, with the original station opening on December the 5th, 1930. Until 1963, the station also served interurban trains of the North Shore Line. This connection was remarkable, as it gave Merchandise Mart a direct link not only to the Chicago suburbs, but also Milwaukee, Wisconsin, door to door. Sadly, this wasn't to last. In the late 1950s, the North Shore Line entirely discontinued service, and within two years of abandonment, most rail lines were physically removed. Anyhow, businessmen and shoppers could arrive via the station from wide and far, and if they were looking for social opportunities, they may have visited the five-story area topping the 18-story main building, known then as the Merchant's Club Tower, which contained reading rooms, smoking rooms, and was a convenient place for retailers to rest and meet with friends. More formal events also occurred here with the assembly hall, where trade meetings, business conferences, and fashion shows were occasionally held. The designers knew what type of guests would be spending time here, so aesthetics were important at every stage of the project. Furthermore, architects knew that the structure would be visible on a rapidly growing Chicago skyline, especially from Wacker Drive or the Civic Opera House. However, not everyone was optimistic. The Chicago Tribune recalls, quote, the roof was designed designed with an unusual galaxy of skylights, tanks, penthouses, and other sky-disfiguring atrocities. The building was emphasized overall by its 80-foot setback from the river. As cosmetically pleasing as these spaces were, the beating heart of the mart was out of sight, inaccessible to the general public, and in ways revolutionary. I'm referring to its sublevel track yard. The entire ground level below the street floor provided one of America's most massive and modern private freight stations. Tracks for incoming carloads of freight extended directly under the building. The Chicago and Northwestern Railroad operated both inbound and outbound orders filtered through its new proviso yard. This solution struck a fantastic balance as down the line, the proviso train yard was a central hub for a great variety of freight and the mart had a direct connection. 
One source notes, when train cargo was offloaded, workers placed products on high-speed conveyors that delivered to the same floor and aisle as the ordering merchant. But there's much more to it, so let's take a tour of the freight center more in depth. This image, taken from the rooftop of the North American Cold Storage Building, shows Merchandise Mart in 1930. In the lower left-hand corner of the frame, we can see the Kenzie Street train bridge. It still exists and has, in a sense, been memorialized as it's left in a permanently upright position. And perhaps a little off topic, but it would appear that the North American Cold Storage Building has indeed avoided the wrecking ball as it's been transformed into lofts. Although I'm just eyeballing this, so I'm not 100% sure. Anyhow, the tracks extending immediately beyond the bridge no longer exist. This area was known as Wolf Point and has since been replaced by the Apparel Center. Trains to the Mart would pass under North Orleans Street and into what was effectively the building's lower level. In addition to the previously mentioned conveyor belts, this area contained the building's columns and support caissons. Various mechanical and heating facilities and two 250 feet of frontage along the riverbank. Now, I'm not sure about the building's modern configuration, but when it was first constructed, the basement consisted of three fan rooms, one drawing the fresh air in and the other to vent exhaust gases, service areas for the building's many elevator shafts, storage, and a locker room for the men who managed the building. Towards the east end of the building was a cold room, a storage area for perishables, which was accessible by a dedicated freight elevator. There was also a refrigeration plant. The ventilating facilities were critical. For instance, the larger of the three fan rooms was located in the basement under the inbound platform. This was connected to a tunnel running under the tracks. From there, a New York blower fan powered with a General Electric motor was installed to pull air through the graded floors. This system serviced the freight house and offices alike, with its surprising air source being the Chicago Tunnel Company, 40 feet below ground. This might sound odd, still, it made a lot of sense as the tunnel air was always a consistent temperature, cool in the summers and warm in the winter. By drawing it into the building, enormous resources were saved, but more on that in a moment. Obviously, with Chicago winters being so brutal, a primary heat source was needed. Hence, steam heating coils were kept warm thanks to the Mart's very own heating plant. Come the brutality of the Chicago summer, a Larkson Parker ice machine located in the inbound basement with an ammonia compressor powered by two Westinghouse alternating current motors of 440 volts each kept things nice and cool. Then there was the brine storage tank of an 8,000 gallon capacity and worked with a more humidifier to supply fresh air and maintain the atmosphere in a constant state of humidity. The freight house ran east and west. The outbound section was located under the northern portion of the building where train platforms joined up with a truck loading dock. While the inbound area ran parallel to the river under the southern portion of the building, drivers could easily access the facility as the merchandise mart was effectively encircled by driveways. The ramp from Kinsey brought drivers in at about 100 feet east of Well Street and at a grade of 5%. The ramp curved sharply to the west and crossed under Wells Street parallel with Kenzie before merging with the tramway serving the outbound platform. In 1930, the outbound facility could handle 1,000 tons of freight daily, with the inbound only accommodating 600 tons. Both the in and outbound platforms extended several hundred feet west of the mart, with the outbound platform having a total length of 1,450 feet and the inbound platform at 1,250 feet. Three tracks could accommodate 93 cars, with the rest accommodating 50. Referring back to our image of the merchandise mart from 1930, you'll see that the platform extends westward. This was done with the hope of possible future development of air rights, a hope so promising that the platforms were constructed with a roofing structure that enabled for dismantlement at a minimum cost. Safety was also a premium here. You see, the handling facility of Marshall Fields & Company was enclosed in fireproof walls, a precaution that perhaps benefited the much larger network the Merchandise Mart was connected to deep below the Chicago streets.
Each section of the Freight House Under Merchandise Mart had two levels, the platform and a basement, with the lower level connected by a 180-foot-long concrete-lined freight transfer tunnel, extending about midway through the building. This transfer tunnel was accessible by dedicated freight elevators on each platform, capable of moving 10,000 pounds per load. But there were also some additional elevators that went much deeper. You see, the platform level of each section of the freight house was connected by an elevator with the underground railway system of the Chicago Tunnel Company. These freight trains ran 40 feet underground and could be used for the shipment of goods or the removal of waste such as coal, ash, or garbage. The Chicago Tunnel Company discontinued the service and received abandonment permission from the city in 1959. And it would be these tunnels, like a skeleton in the closet, that would come back to haunt the merchandise mart decades later. By the 1980s, the rail section of the freight house had been transformed beyond recognition, and the old connections to the Chicago tunnels sat dormant, slowly fading to decay, until 1991, when near the Kenzie Street Bridge, a new set of pilings was being driven into the riverbed when a miscalculation occurred, resulting in critical damage to the forgotten tunnels. City officials were slow to respond as no immediate emergency was obvious. However, reports of the damaged tunnels were circulating, supported by videotape evidence of the cracked tunnel oozing with mud and water from the inside. Although the risk of flooding was understood by George W. Jackson, the chief engineer who built the system in 1909, and went as far as installing bulkheads to mitigate risk, water had always been an issue. Actually, by 1913, leaks had become commonplace to the point that pumps were installed around the city to remove water. Fast forward back to 1992, on April the 13th, six months later, the tunnel finally gave in and river water gushed into the forgotten system, flooding the majority of Chicago's most prevalent buildings and Merchandise Mart was the first victim. The Chicago Tribune article by Flynn McRoberts reads, it wasn't even 6 a.m. Monday, but Bill McGing, the overnight boiler room engineer at the Merchandise Mart, already knew that this was no ordinary start to another work week. Water was inexplicably pouring into the third and deepest sub-basement of the building. Realizing that something was very wrong, he grabbed the nearby telephone and called the Chicago Fire Department. The then executive vice president of Merchandise Mart, Thomas Kennedy, stated that around 5.57, the worker actually heard the water rushing in. By 6.10 a.m., the first firefighters arrived and set up a command post for the emergency. They were followed by workers from the city water and sewer department, searching for what they believed was a sewer line rupture. By 7.30 a.m., things were evident as the basements of Marshall Fields, City Hall, and many other buildings reported flooding and only had one commonality the abandoned Chicago freight tunnels. This flood that was first noticed at the Merchandise Mart was so extreme that Commonwealth Edison turned off power to sections of the loop to avoid short outs. Workers were evacuated, and by 9.30 a.m., the Army Corps of Engineers were dumping gravel into the riverbed with the hopes of plugging the hole. Chicago's underground subway trains were diverted and extra buses were brought in to help accommodate logistics. Eventually, the leak was plugged and the city drained floodwater from the basements by digging a 50-foot deep hole next to a deep tunnel drop shaft from where they created a trench between the Chicago freight tunnels and the access point to the deep city tunnel before they punctured the drop shaft to create drainage. The damages of 1.95 billion dollars, or about 3.5 billion dollars today, were so extreme that many compare the disaster to the Great Chicago Fire. However, unlike the old Well Street Station, which burnt down on that same land, the Merchandise Mart would recover. By all indications, this is really a story of gentrification. It's easy to forget 
but a decade before construction, the ground where Merchandise Mart would stand had fallen to decay, and the area around it was in a similar condition. The Merchandise Mart had a significant impact on the site. Even as early as 1930, on the corner of Wells and Kenzie Street, directly opposite the Big Mart, a complete revitalization of a four-story brick building took place within 90 days, specifically because the new owner trusted in the economic rise of the area. Furthermore, the acquisition of this property removed unsavory saloons from the nearby corner. And with those saloons went the bootlegging criminals from the decade prior. Perhaps Chicago Tribune put it best. The coming of the merchandise mart is slowly but definitely beginning to show its influence throughout the district surrounding its site. A different and more prosperous class of tenants is inquiring about a store, loft, and miscellaneous space. What was a year or so ago one of the most neglected of the near-loop districts is now showing signs of transformation. As LaSalle Street has widened and improved, and as the various undertakings of the North Central Association become more effective, the Mart District should change its character entirely. By the time Marshall Fields died in 1906, he was the director of 28 corporations with a personal net worth of $120 million. And where money will fade, the legacy that his company left Chicago, the Merchandise Mart, is so physically large that it's impossible to overlook. Today, Merchandise Mart is the 44th largest building in the world, and although since 2008 it no longer has its own zip code, it is an absolute cornerstone of the Chicago story. And we'll leave it there for today. I hope you'll subscribe so that we'll meet again. And until we do, this is Ryan Sokash signing off.